This month, Scientific American had an article on a weird process called photophoresis. Photophoresis? Photophoresis. It's the gory process by which the patient ingests a compound called sorolin, P-S-O-R-A-L-E-N. P -S -O -R -A -L -E -N. Mm -hmm. Have you ever smelled the roux? I hope you're not real sensitive to the roux. I'm not. But the roux contains sorolin, as does citrus and uh, bishop's weed and several other vegetables, parsnip and celery in very small quantities. But in this process called photophoresis, the patient is given the sorolin, blood is withdrawn from the patient, and then the blood is irradiated with ultraviolet light. And in this process, uh, some of the leukemic cells are damaged. Then they re-inject this blood into the patient and it tends to vaccinate him against further encroachment of the leukemia. So these sarlins are being experimentally studied in certain types of leukemia, one called lymphoma. Now, this was in February 14, 1987. I read about this in Science News, and I wrote to one of the scientists because of the last sentence in that article. It says, in vitro, if I remember this correctly, the sarlin or the photophoresis is controlling the AIDS virus. So this was a great interest to me. I wrote to him and he did write back rather guardedly because they don't want to let us know if they're on the break of a, a big discovery. But he said, yes, in vitro, the sarlin would arrest the AIDS virus without arresting the white blood cell. And that's really what AIDS is, the battle between the white blood cell and the AIDS virus. And I had been playing with this herb for years. As a matter of fact, I was criticized because it can cause photosensitivities in somebody. And until April 23rd of this year, I hardly believed them. But down at the Richmond Herb Festival, I wadded up this and I rubbed it right there. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can see a little bit of a dark spot it's there shiny. now. Yes. But if you don't see it now, I guarantee you will two weeks from now. I am now damaging the DNA. Really? As soon as I put this in the sunshine, the activity of that compound sarlin with ultraviolet light causes a bridging in the DNA. And they have clonal antibodies that will go to DNA that's so damaged, such that if that were a tumor, I could direct the poison that would kill the tumor because that's the only place in my body that's going to have this DNA damaged by sarlin. Now, that's not a very dramatic blister now but I got some slides that make it look pretty good now without the ultraviolet light mm -hmm. nothing will happen so now I'm finishing off my self experimentation or shall we call it self flagellation but there'll be a brown spot tomorrow mm -hmm. and next month and two or three months from now and if I get cancer there three or four years from now you know that Duke uh, was playing with fire once yeah We'll have it all documented. Yes. <laughs> it's a very, it's really breakthrough science right now. And I'm just a botanist and I don't really understand DNA, but I know that that's a very positive uh, reaction within two days after I do that. Now, is this new? The Asian Indians 2,000 years ago used to use the herb called, ironically, Sorelia, P S O R A L E A. It's in the bean family. There were dark-skinned Indians who would have white spots, and that was called vitiligo or vitiligo, I don't know how it's pronounced. Leucoderma, I'll get around it that way. And they would rub this seed on the white spot, and it would color them up. 2,000 years ago, they knew about this. Independently, the Egyptians were using something called bishop's weed, Amy Magus, and I just planted some back by the primrose path yesterday to see if I can get a second crop this year. That seed contains 2% of sarlin, and the Egyptians were using that for the same thing. And I think you'll see the black spot in a couple of days, and you'll see why they used it. But we learn a lot from our forefathers this way. Yes, and, and it's contained in that. It's, it's only where, the, where I rubbed, mm -hmm. where both the, the drug, sarlin, and, the, and the ultraviolet. Yeah, now if I pinpointed ultraviolet only to a wart, there or something of very small size. That's the only place you would get the brown coloration. Well, we'll have to check in two weeks and see what the, uh, the your wrist looks like. What else do you have? Well, this one has probably got more mystique than it deserves. America exports 
$40 million worth of this a year, would you believe? Most no. of it going to the Orient. Can you guess what it is? This is the famous ginseng. Just dug, I brought it to the garden because it's uh, way down in the woods. It's like me, it's getting allergic to sunshine. Matter of fact, you cannot grow it in full sun. It has to have about 80% shade. This one was planted at least 10 years ago and we're going to replant it here in the shady part of the garden just to see how it will take transplanting this time of year. Theoretically, you would let it die down and then plant this part this fall and then it would come back again next year. You could harvest these fruits and plant your seeds and uh, get another plant from it. The big reason for this is that the Orientals believe it tends to rejuvenate man and the more this root resembles man, the more they'll pay for that root. This one isn't very man sized at all, but if you if you have a good imagination you see a head here, an arm there, and a leg there, and a tail here. It's a satirical man, but some people think it makes man satirical anyhow. And they eat it. They use it mostly in teas. Very few people eat it. It's not a very pleasant taste to me. But the, the Orientals tend to cook it with a chick chicken or pork broth. And if I was selling ginseng, I would like people to believe what I was told by the Chinese. They said you have to take it for six years for it really to, to work as a long-term tonic and rejuvenator. <laughs> the Chinese have told me several things that I viewed with suspicion that later proved out. Now, I think I'll run those by you. The Chinese told me that ginseng moved at night, and I certainly didn't believe that. But... Oh, several years ago, my daughter and I planted a hundred roots right over there. We took a hundred three-year-old roots, much smaller than this, put them in a very nice organic bed, tamped them in, watered them down, and then forgot them, except me, the good farmer, comes out the next morning at dawn to examine my handiwork. Over half of those hundred roots were laying out beside the hole where I had planted them. So in a sense, the Chinese were right. Those ginseng moved at night. I suspect that it was a raccoon looking for grubs <laughs> attracted to that uh, moist organic soil around the root. The roots themselves were undamaged, but they certainly had moved. The Chinese also told me that ginseng took a sabbatical, and that struck me as rather far-fetched. Until one year, we had to transplant a population that was about to suffer the bulldozer, and July the 4th of that year, we transplanted 300 plants to the South 40 here. And I kept records on those, each individual, for several years. And every year, at least 10% of those stayed underground all year. and didn't come back until the next spring. So once again, the Chinese appeared to be right. Ginseng does take a sabbatical at least under these circumstances. So who am I to doubt the Oriental when he says this nice herb will make an old man young again and that's why I got a woods full of it. <laughs> Do you recommend it as an alternative crop for people who are interested in um, farming different things today? There have been signs or, or ads in magazines that say make $45,000 an acre and theoretically it's possible. But if I were to plant this seed today it wouldn't germinate until spring after next. Mm -hmm. It would be five years beyond that before I'd have a harvestable root. Mm -hmm. But even spread out over five years, 45000 is is $9,000 an acre. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty good return. And some few farmers do really make good money at ginseng. I would suspect that the majority lose, though. It's, uh, it's got diseases. Mine here is infested with white bugs that could be very well trans emitting a virus that can completely wipe out my investment. Mm -hmm. However, I have a very low maintenance farm and uh, this has been toughening it out for 10 years with very little attention as most of my uh, back 40 experiments do. Very low maintenance. But yes, this is a good, the beauty of this is you can grow it in the woods, mm -hmm. in the forest. As a matter of fact, you have to have the shade. In Wisconsin, which produces probably half of our cultivated ginseng, Marathon County grows it mostly under lath. Oh. But uh, that's even more labor intensive. But it's nice to grow this uh, in your woods while you're growing the other crops. There are other crops that you could grow with it in the woods. Golden seal is an herb that has an increase in market. 
and your May apple grows down there. For years, we even before what I told you about the the new discovery about May apple, there was an American market for a hundred tons a year of May apple. It used to show up in Don's little liver pills. I'm told. I don't know whether we had a hundred metric tons of Don's little liver pills or not. But today, with the new cancer activity, we can expect a, a an increased pressure on May apple, either from here or from an Asian Indian species. There's much more interest in herb farming and gardening than there was, say, 10 years or 20 years ago. Yeah, farther back here, I have a culinary or uh, culinary section of the garden. Uh, cities as big as Baltimore and Washington can support a guy just providing basil to that market, the ethnic market. It's uh, particularly big with uh, Italian population. And many of these things, parsley, tarragon, they require a little talent, and small, small farmers can make a, a, a relatively decent living providing these to specialty chefs in a big city. Mm -hmm.